<laughs> I'll take it by your applause that some people here can relate to the video, yes? <laughs> No, what, what, come on, look at you people, you beautiful people. This is such a great day for you, December 31st. This is the last day that you're going to enjoy sugar, that you're going to enjoy cake, that you're ever going to have queso again. I mean, this section, you're going to have all salads from now on, right? <laughs> Nothing but salads and not even dressing, just lettuce and the green stuff that you find in your yard or somewhere, really locally sourced. M maybe kale. Just kale. <laughs> kale smoothies for breakfast, kale juice at the gym. I'll find you all at the gym tomorrow, right? Drinking kale juice on your elliptical machine if you're not at home studying your Bible all day long, right? That's what New Year's is all about. But seriously, we make some big goals at the start of a new year sometimes, don't we? Uh, I just found a study online that kind of said what the typical goals are, especially for this coming year. So does anybody want to guess? Let's have someone from section number one yell out family feud style here. What's the number one goal people set? This is the wrong section. You're disqualified. <laughs> How about you guys? Other than that, any goal? Other than that? <laughs> You're disqualified yet again. This section is done. You're dead to me. <laughs> Any other goals that are common, you guys? You lose weight. Oh, my gosh. Can you even hear me? Can, is this thing on? They're not listening to each other, perhaps. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the goals that people typically set. Uh, eat better. Exercise more. Spend less money. Read more books. Learn a new skill. Get a new job. Make new friends. And I love these last two. This is actually on the survey. Focus more on appearance. Focus less on appearance. <laughs> but we all set these goals from time to time, and today's message is not so much me talking against goal setting, because goals are good to set, I firmly believe. But I believe in all of our experiences of setting goals, we come face to face with this reality uh, that we realize that January 1st, believe it or not, is not a magical day, the only day of the year when we can make life change. When we'll decide to do something and for it to take and for it to stick. Because here's the thing, we try to set goals, we try to become a new person, right? We try to become a new person on January 1st and bring our life into alignment with what we think is important for our life. Loving more and giving more and serving more and learning more, more and more of this and less and less of this. I don't have to tell you guys, I don't have to preach a sermon on what we should set as our goals because you know what the goals are. That's not the problem. The problem is that we don't ever follow through on our goals, right? And so the question is, if January 1st is not this magical day, the only day that we can make a change, and we know there are changes we have to make, and we're trying to become a new you, but we wake up on January 1st, and guess what? We're the old you. We're the same you. We've always been. We're going to need something a little deeper than a resolution. And if that's you, and I think you can relate... Uh, then today's message is good news for you. In fact, it's really, really, really good news for all of us. Because in today's passage we're going to look at, we're going to see a change that's much deeper than just external behavior modification, just making a marginal improvement in one area of your life, thinking that's going to change things, and then watching that fizzle away by February. But today is a message about a God who wants to change your entire life from the inside out, from the very core of your being to give you a new creation on the inside of you and a new message and a new mission in this world. And so let's just dive right in together and study this message that I have titled, Happy New You. As you can see on the screen, the text is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. And it's a really great passage. Paul says, to the Corinthian church. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for your word, and we want to come before it now humbly. Uh, We want to come before it carefully and with great precision and with a passion to know what you are saying to us in these words. And God, we want to open up our lives to you, to allow you in and to invite you in and to ask of you Uh, That we wouldn't just hear words today, we wouldn't have an academic study, we wouldn't just learn something new, but God, that you would deeply work on the core of our being and our hearts and our spirits and our souls, that you would ignite in us a fresh passion for the mission that you've given us, that you would open our eyes again to the beauty and the glory of Christ Jesus and what he did for us in this message that you've given us for the whole wide world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to put these verses uh, behind me on the screen. We're just going to start uh, by looking in verse 16. But again, as I always like to do, I want to remind you what we've just read is a small little part, just a paragraph or two, uh, from a letter that Paul, a first century guy, wrote to a church that he very much cared about, the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church, uh, this letter is kind of warm. It's warmer than 1 Corinthians. Uh, He wrote letters to them, correcting them and helping them and encouraging them. And he had to to do that because they were facing some problems. The first century church, no different than our century church, is not a perfect church. It's filled with humans, sinful humans, just trying to get along and trying to figure out their way. And so the first century church in, in Corinth, they were just struggling with false doctrine and false teachers. There were these people that he referred to as super apostles that came into the church and put Paul down because he wasn't as good a speaker as them, and he wasn't this and wasn't that, and they were preaching what amounted to a different gospel, a different message. And so Paul had to visit them twice, and he, and he had to write them letters, and he had to correct them and encourage them. And so what we're reading today is, is this letter to this church, just a small part of it, and he's correcting their view of what they think Jesus is. And uh, we're just going to dive right in as he begins right there. He says these words in verse 16. So from now on, uh, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Paul says he has changed how he thinks about people and specifically about Christ. So from a worldly point of view, and you'll hear the worldly point of view if you watch um, the news stations or read Time or People or Washington Post, they all do these specials this time of year, like who was Jesus really? What was the historical Jesus? And they can, you know, look around for artifacts and and whatnot, but uh, what you'll see with your worldly eyes is not the full story. And so Paul is saying, hey, before I met Jesus, I had this view of Jesus. Uh, It was very much like the physical view. Here he was, a first century carpenter, an idealist who had some ideas, who was a good speaker and attracted quite a crowd. And for Paul, because he was a very, very, very passionate Pharisee, a Jew, uh, he also believed that Jesus was an aberration to the Jewish faith, that what he was preaching was totally wrong and he was leading people astray. And so Paul saw Jesus as a, a blasphemer a charlatan, as someone who had to be uh, totally stamped out. This movement just had to be stopped. That's what Paul says was his worldly view of Christ. But then he says, you know what? I changed my view of Christ. I no longer view Christ in this way. I no longer view him from a worldly point of view, but I view him through new eyes. We do so no longer. So the rest of what we're going to read is kind of about that. It's about how does Paul now view Christ and how should we view Christ? Verse 17, he gets right into it. Here's the amazing thing that God did through Christ. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. 
The old has gone and the new is here. Here is the amazing thing Paul wants to communicate to us today. And the key thing I want you to take away today is that God did something amazing in Christ. And that amazing thing is he made a new creation. Now, I don't know what Bible you're reading in this morning. This is the NIV I've got on the screen. But a lot of versions say a lot of different things here. I'll just put them on the screen so you can see. The KJV has it like this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We have this word here, creature. And we have the pronoun he. So the KJV is interpreting what Paul says to mean when Christ comes, he makes us, you and me, into a new creature. The ESV changes to the word creation, but keeps this pronoun he. The NIV does away with the he and just says there is a new creation. It has come. So why does the Bible say so many different things? What is that all about? Well, I want to tell you, if you look in the original Greek, we don't have some words. We don't have those words. And so basically, the original Greek reads like this. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. That's it. And so if you're a Bible translator, you kind of have to fill in the blanks. And you kind of have to ask yourself, what did Paul mean when he said what he said? And as you can see on the screen, different Bible translations put it different ways. Now, the question for us is, what way did Paul intend it to be? Uh, The research I did said it like this. Paul never used uh, this word, this noun for creation to refer to an individual person. More likely, what is going on here, this phrase, new creation, is a very theologically loaded term. It's a, it's a term that is found in the Bible and other places to refer to something else. In the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, the apocalyptic literature, you see uh, this new creation referring to uh, not just me as an individual, but this whole new thing that God is going to do one day. This whole new thing that God is going to do one day. Uh, in theology class, we call it the eschaton. Everyone say that with me. This is your, your theological word of the day, so you'd be really smart over lunch. The eschaton. Isn't that fun? That's just Greek for last thing, last things. So eschatology is the study of the last things. It's the last chapter, the final chapter, the culmination of all of history. God has been guiding history to its final point, its eschaton, its final chapter. And so in the books of the Bible, talking about that last chapter, they use this phrase that it's going to be a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth. And so that's why the NIV here has, the new creation has come, because the NIV is saying, you know what, it may be that Paul means something bigger than just, hey, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation, you're a new creature. It it does mean that, but it's something bigger than that. And that's the heart of what I want to say this morning, is that I think the NIV gets it absolutely right. It leaves open the possibility for both ways of understanding this verse. It doesn't insert the he. You can still understand it that way, but it may be both are true. If Christ has come into your life, you're a new creation. Yes, number one, that is true, and that is good. That is good news, because you and I were dead in our sins We weren't in need of just a teacher who would point the way to God. We weren't in need of some 12-step program or some behavioral modification or some wise words or some system. We were in need of more than medicine. We were in need of spiritual CPR. We were in need of defibrillators. We were in need of resurrection life to bring us back from the dead. And praise God, if you're in Christ, if you're united in Christ, if you belong to Christ, if you have faith in Christ, that is exactly what you've got is new life. So yeah, that's part of this, number one. But the other part, number two, I think is also there. And that is that God is doing a new thing. Like a long prophesied ago, God has begun to do a new thing. When Jesus came on earth, he inaugurated the kingdom. He began to bring things right that had gone wrong. And so there's this overlap that's going on now. There's this old system, and there's this new system. And uh, Scott likes to draw. I'm going to take the risk of drawing live. So this, would everybody like to do a Venn diagram? Is church really complete without a Venn diagram? Okay. How's that, Scott? Is that good? Is that a Venn diagram? (laughs) This is the old, and this is the new creation. 
the old way of being and the new way of being. Right now, they're overlapping. Christ has come. Christ has inaugurated the kingdom. Christ has started to put things right. But all things aren't right. People are still dying. People are still getting sick. Satan is doing wild things in the world, and not everything is as it should be. One day, it will be. But right now, we live in this weird time between the times. And that's the middle part of our fancy Venn diagram right here. And I want you to know, I think it's really important that you know what that overlap is, okay? It's you. That, I think, is the deepest message of this passage and of the Bible, that this world all around us is going haywire and bananas and cuckoo and nothing makes sense and it's full of pain and it's full of anguish and it's full of sorrow and it looks like everything is spinning out of control more and more every day on the international scale, on the, in our nation, in our lives, in our communities. It's crazy out there. And yet God rules and reigns in our hearts and the eschaton is breaking into the world right here and right now through us. And that's the mission we're on. That's the mission. That's quite a good reason to get out of bed, right? That's a pretty good way to start 2017 with a strong mission. I put it this way. God is making all things new by the ones he's made new. Let me say that again. God is making all things new by the ones he's made new. Folks, we are not saved to sit. We're saved to serve. We've got a mission. You may have grown up in a church or heard a gospel message at some point in your life that goes something like this, accept the Lord Jesus and you'll go to heaven one day when you die. And you say yes, and then you live your life however you want to live it and you just sit and you just wait and maybe complain about how bad the world is as if you had no part in it being that way or helpless to make it any better. We're not saved to sit, we're saved to serve and this is the heart of service. We're called to be God's agents in this world right here and right now to transform every part of culture from academics to law to journalism to governments. I mean, every part of it, we are supposed to live life the way God intended and to be his witnesses here. And I I believe it's a better way of life. I believe when you live life the way it's meant to be lived, it is better. And I believe people will notice it's better. It's almost like we are his representatives here on earth. It's like we're representatives of this new kingdom that's coming one day. We are right here. We're like time travelers. You and me, we're like time travelers from this this coming kingdom living right here and right now in this world as his representatives. And that's exactly what the next few verses say. Uh, In verse 18, we'll just continue on here. Paul says this, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That Christ was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul says the gospel message belongs to us, and that is a key part of what it means to be a new creation, a new creature living in the old world, is that we are his ambassadors, we are his representatives, and I love that word. I mean, think about it. This word ambassador is not all that foreign to us, right? I mean, the United States has ambassadors of their own. Uh, We have ambassadors that go to all sorts of other countries around the world, and they represent us. They represent you and me and our government and our decisions and our diplomacy, and they represent us either well or not, and hopefully they represent us well. And so the question for all of us as we represent the king of heaven to this world is do we represent him well 
or not? Do we give people a foretaste of heaven? I love that sound, huh? That's what I said too when I wrote that down. Because that's exactly what new creation is all about. New creation is about this coming day when there's a new heaven and a new earth, a new way of being, when all the old stuff is cast out, when evil is completely banished, when the Lord's prayer is answered and we say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that prayer is finally answered and his kingdom does come and his will finally is done right here, right now, just as it is in heaven, unquestioningly, immediately, perfectly, all the time, all day, every day. So do we give people a foretaste of that? Do people look at the way we live and say, man, that is, that's different and in a good way. That is, if that's what heaven is like, yeah, I want a piece of that. It's a really convicting question. Are we showing people what the new creation will be like? Are we loving like the king loves? And do we have the right message? That's an important part of being an ambassador is having the right message. And Paul says the message is this. God is not counting people's sins against them. So we implore you, be reconciled to God. That's the message, and that's the last thing I want us to look at today, is the message that we're entrusted with. We're his ambassadors, and we've been given this great message, this important message, this gospel message, this good news. And the message is this simply, God is not counting people's sins against them anymore. If you're a smart person who's thinking deeply about this, You've got to be asking a question right now in your mind. How can that possibly be? How can it possibly be that this God, this holy God, this righteous God, this perfect God, this God of justice, will just not count people's sins against them anymore? That doesn't sound very just to me. It doesn't sound like a good judge to me to just say, well, yeah, I know you murdered somebody, but whatever, I will not count that against you. You're good. You're good to go. But the Bible says God is still just. He's just and the justifier of the one that he's forgiven. So Paul does this awesome thing as Paul is, is prone to do. He takes a little aside, a little parenthetical statement here, and he just says, hey, this is how that's possible. Here's a little theology for you. Here's just a sentence, Corinthians, to let you know what your message is and how it's possible. And he says these great words, uh, one of the first verses that I ever memorized, because it's such a beautiful, succinct a statement of what God has done and, and what this is all about. He said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I think this verse solves a lot of the uh, issues that people have with Christianity. The questions people might have about why Jesus came or what he did. But let's start at the beginning, okay? Let's start at the beginning. And the beginning is simply this. A lot of people think of life in these terms. I have done some good things, and I've done some bad things. And if at the end of all my days, the good is a little, a little more than the bad, then I will be good. I'll be good to go. God will have to accept me. I'm more good than bad on most days. Yeah, college was a rough patch, and I did some stupid stuff, but I've been putting some coins in the good column ever since. And if my accounting is right, I should be good for heaven. Now, I want us to think about what that means uh, visually. And so I brought two scales with me. Uh, actually, I just brought one scale because the other scale you can't find anymore. People don't really use it. The first scale is just like a kitchen scale. And by the way, I don't use this either. This is a prop. This does not turn on. We've had it for five years, and we've never used it. But for the sake of argument, this is a kitchen scale. Could be a postal scale as far as you're concerned. Whatever. It's a scale. The other kind of scale uh, is maybe you've seen it. My parents used to have a decorative one with two, two things, and she put something over here. So to weigh something, you'd have to have a known measure, like a gram, and you'd kind of balance it out. 
I couldn't find one of those, because that's a lot of trouble. Who wants to do that when you just have this, if it has batteries? So we're going to have to use another way to illustrate that. Uh, so I need a volunteer. Roger, <laughs> thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Come on up. Roger's going to be our set of scales. Hey. Good job, Roger. I know you're going to do awesome. <laughs> so, yes. So we tend to think, a lot of us tend to think of life in the, get your, get your hands out, you're a scale. <laughs> get your hands out. So a lot of people uh, tend to think of life in this way. Oh yeah, it's exercise. It's the new year. You're getting started. Uh, yeah, so I argued with my wife this morning and I did not honor her. And that wasn't good. And I was greedy and I coveted what my neighbors got for Christmas that I saw in their trash yesterday. Nice Amazon box. But Can I bend my hands? No, you can't bend your hands. Be a man. Come on. Step up, Roger. <laughs> oh, wow. But, you know, I did some good this, today, too. I helped an old lady across the street, and I, I encouraged my kids. And, <laughs> and you can see the dilemma, like, you know, life's kind of a teetering on edge, and uh, this one thing I've got to do before I die, which way is it going to tip the scales? Is it going to be, is it going to be a lie? Oops. <laughs> Don't worry, it's just Calvin's commentary. It's no big deal. Yeah. And that's how a lot of us think about life. But I would have you know, and I want you really to know, that this picture is not at all what the Bible says about life. I don't know where it comes from, but it's not in the Bible. The Bible is more like this scale, which is very simple. It reads zero right now, or it would if it had batteries. And the way that God's economy and God's judging works is he's perfect, and the standard is perfection. And so if anything above zero is read on the scale, that's how the scales work. That's too much sin. All right, Raj, thanks. You're Thank good. You. I was wondering. For <laughs> and here's the worst part. Here's the worst part. Even the smallest, seemingly most insignificant thing that we do, even if it's just a motivation in our heart that's off, maybe we're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. And Scripture says anything that's not done in faith to the glory of God is sin. That tiny speck is enough to condemn us. And there's nothing that we can do to make repayment. I just read something awesome in seminary that explained to me why that is so. Why do you think that we can't make up for what we've done? Well, the ancient theologian I read put it this way. God is due complete honor and complete service. 24-7, every day of your life. That's what God, the creator, is due. And so what are you going to do to make up for your past sin? Honor him? You already owe him that. You're just doing what you're supposed to do. You're not going above and beyond to pay for your past wrong. You're just doing what you're supposed to do that day. There's no way to make repayment for your past sin. And so that context is why this verse is so beautiful. The picture of humanity is all of us going around with our sin credit card, just swiping and swiping with every moment of our lives that we don't put God first and charging up this balance, this debt that we'll never be able to pay. And Scripture says this, that God took that debt, that balance, that sin, and he put it on the one who had no sin for us. And so God took on himself, God the Son, Jesus, on the cross, took on all of the weight of our disobedience, our trespasses, our sin, everything. And he paid it. But that's only half of the equation because get this, it works the other way too, that his righteousness goes to us. 
And I just love this verse. The first time I read it, it just opened my eyes, this beautiful truth. Like, you've always wondered if Jesus just had to die on a cross, why didn't God just teleport him down at 33 years old and just have it quick? No, the mission of, of Jesus was bigger than that. And, and part of that mission was to live this perfect life that, that we should have lived to fulfill every last bit of righteousness, to be the perfect man, the perfect person that fulfilled all of God's dreams for humanity and showed the world what humanity was supposed to be. And he did that so that that would one day be credited to our account. Not only did he take that sin credit card debt of ours and take it all away and pay it, but all of the righteousness that he has all that he had saved up in his 401k and in his Roth IRA and his bank account and Bitcoin or wherever he stores it, that was all transferred to us. And the prophet Isaiah saw this coming a long time ago, and he said this, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I don't know how you can read a passage like that and a passage that we just read and not understand what Jesus did. But there's still people out there, and there's still plenty of churches out there that teach Jesus was just a, a man who showed us how to love, who called us to a higher way of life, who, who was a good teacher. There are churches who say that. But look at this verse once you color code the hymns and the ours, the he's and the us's. There is an actual transfer going on here. He was suffering, but it wasn't because he was a sinner. It was because he took our sin upon himself. He was pierced, but it wasn't for his transgressions. It was for ours. He was punished, but it didn't bring him peace. It brought us peace. We're the ones that have gone astray, and he's the one that got all of our sin and all of our wrong laid on him. It's a beautiful thing. It's a heartbreaking thing, but it's a beautiful thing. Theologians call this imputation. So for those of you who want yet another word to sound really smart over dinner today, this is a banking term. It's a theological term. It's a, it's a financial term. That God made this transaction of moving our sin onto Christ on the cross and moving his riches, his righteousness, out of his account and into ours so that right here, right now, this morning, if you're in Christ, when God looks at you, he's not disappointed. He's not counting your sins against you like, oh, Bill, this is the 33rd time you've done this. What are you doing? He's not counting your sins against you, but when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Not just that you're clean, but that you have lived the perfect life. C.H. Spurgeon put it this way. Of the Christian, it can be said that he does not owe God's justice anything, for Christ has paid the debt his people owed. For this reason, the believer owes the more to love. I'm a debtor to God's grace and forgiving mercy, but I am no debtor to his justice, for he'll never accuse me of a debt already paid. And further, all the blessings which you would have had if you had kept the law and more are yours because Christ has kept it for you. All the love and the acceptance which perfect obedience could have obtained of God belong to you because Christ was perfectly obedient on your behalf and has imputed all his merits to your account. God has paid your debt. And so the message is, welcome to the family. Welcome home. Be reconciled to God. His arms are open. He is not counting your sins against you. And so as we move to wrap this up today and we talk about application, application number one is simply this. I want to implore you, as Paul implored the Corinthian church, be reconciled to God. He said that with urgency. He wasn't too proud to beg. In fact, begging was a lot like what he did. He went from town to town, and he wasn't about making his own name famous or being a great speaker or winning accolades, but he was begging people, begging people 
imploring people be reconciled to God. And so if you're here as a person who has not been reconciled to God, this is the gospel, this is the good news that just by faith in Christ, you can be reconciled to God and your sin debt can be paid. But application number two this morning for the rest of us, us new creations, remember, remember what we said, God is in the business of making all things new by the ones he's made new. That's you and me. We're his ambassadors. And so in 2018, let's be bold. Let's be those time travelers from this different age, this different country, this different way of being, this different kingdom with a different king than our world has. Let's be good ambassadors for that kingdom. Let's bring that way of life into this world here and now. How's that for a goal for 2018? So when the clock strikes midnight tonight and you're looking for a resolution, how about something way bigger than a resolution? How about something like a whole new way of life, a whole new way of being, being a new creation? God, thank you. Thank you so much that we get to be the answer to the Lord's prayer, the model prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, your kingdom is coming, and it's coming through me, and it's coming through all these folks in this room today. We thank you for that, God, that you would use us as your ambassadors, as your representatives, as your servants, as your messengers in this world. You know, uh, it's, it's weird. I've been doing this for 20 years almost, and uh, I've probably preached 10 New Year's Eve sermons or New Year's sermons. I don't know why people just want me to talk about New Year's. Maybe it's because I'm such a goal-oriented person, but uh, I really do think that um, New Year's Eve is a great time to just step back and to think about goals and to see the gap of where you are and where you should be. And for some people, that gap is more than just, I want to lose that last five pounds, or I want to contribute to my child's trust fund more aggressively. But that gap is, I've made a royal mess of my life up to this point. I've really messed up. And there's some people here who've done that, and you're just thinking, oh, if I could only start new, only if there were a way for all that to be wiped away. And I'm here to tell you this morning, there is a way. A hundred percent, there's a way. And his name is Jesus. And I implore you, I beg you. <laughs> I beg you if you're that person, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God today. Start the new year with the best decision you'll ever make. There's people here that would love to pray with you, including me, and uh, we just welcome you. We welcome you into this family, into a place of belonging, of care, of support, of encouragement, as we just point one another to our great Savior Jesus and live into this new way of being, this new creation that we are bringing here and now into this world. And so I send you out now with that mission, his mission, with his power. So go now in the grace, love, and peace of our God, who's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.